I got it. Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. We love us some Mercury retrograde guys. This is just the way it is with old Mercury and um, doing its retrograde, doing its- This has been a Mercury retrograde doozy. Yes. Like the worst out of all. (laughs) Well, and the good thing about, I mean- I, I always say this every Mercury retrograde, like, like before we get into the astrology, because that's what we're going to talk about today with beautiful Emmy and beautiful Steffi. And we're going to, we're going to, I just called you what tomorrow calls you Steffi. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to piggyback to onto our last conversation. But um, yeah, the, the thing about Mercury retrograde, like the things you don't want to do in Mercury retrograde, you don't want to sign a new contracts. You don't want to get married during a retrograde. You don't want to, you know, start a new job. You don't want to get a new cell phone. You don't want to get a new car or a new laptop. You know, you just have to be very, um, weary of communication stuff you know that's what you have to be weary of however the good thing about mercury retrograde is that it's a good time for projects you've been working on to be completed yes so um with that being said i'm gonna pass the ball over to you emmy since you're the one that is looking at our upcoming month okay sure stars (laughs) um so i didn't do uh an in-depth um look into things like I normally do, but I'm just going to touch on a few of the themes that are going on. And like Bryce said, we're piggybacking on our last conversation that we had a couple of days ago. And right now is an excellent time to do shadow work. Um, We have Venus in Virgo and Mercury is right next door in Libra. So these two aren't conjunct right now, but they will be towards the end of this retrograde. And Venus in Virgo is very cooperative, very peaceful, very uh, humanitarian. So it's a really good time for self-care. And because Virgo is very organized and, you know, making lists and doing things um, in a detailed fashion, it would be great to do shadow work, especially if you are following a certain formula like um, what I'm doing with my catalyst journal. And I got that from Aaron Abke's uh, content. Um, I'm also working through the 12 steps in my recovery program. So those are just examples of mine. There are so many ways to do shadow work. It's just kind of a trial and error thing with what works for you. Cause everyone is different. Everyone's astrological picture is different. How people learn and process information is different. For me, this particular retrograde isn't as bad as others, but it's because I have my natal Mercury in an air sign. Libra is an air sign. So it's not quite as disruptive um, for me as it could be for other people. Like Stephanie, you were saying that this is a really big doozy um, of a retrograde. And, you know, if we were able to work with nature and take the time off of work and to be able to slow down because what retrogrades are is like a slowdown. It's a slowdown and and it can create and cause chaos because we can't slow down our lives to work with it. And so that's why it seems so bad and chaotic is because we're not able to work with nature. If we were able to, then we could take the time and sit with ourselves and slow down and make sure that our emails and texts are going to the right people and we're saying the right things and we can mull things over before we have a, a serious talk with some someone. And like what, what Bryce said, you know, if unless you have done thorough work and revisited um, signing contracts or getting married or those kinds of things, unless you have made absolute certain that it is going to be a smooth transaction, wait, wait till Mercury's done. Um, it's just, it, it will just work out better that way. Um, okay. So Venus is in Virgo. Mercury is in Libra. Mercury is going to travel back to Virgo and make a conjunction to Libra. So the reason why I I believe that this is a good time for self-care is because because Virgo is so organized and detailed, you're able to have those conversations with yourself to just sit in meditation and write things down and feel the feelings like yesterday. Oh my gosh, I would completely devolved emotionally. I did part of a bar workout that Bryce was talking about and Stephanie in our last video, 
I did part of a, a bar workout and it broke something loose and I could not figure out what exactly it was stemming from. And I tried for a good portion of my day to try to figure out what it was stemming from so I could, you know, give myself Reiki and, you know, maybe send energy to that and heal that. But I could not figure out what it was from. I have no idea. So I just, after I couldn't figure out, I was like, okay, I'm just going to allow myself to feel. I'm not going to try to escape. I'm not going to try to cover it up. I'm not going to, you know, cover it with toxic positivity. I'm just going to feel this. And it was shitty. It freaking sucks. I was a hot mess. Like I had to tell my husband, like, you just need to leave me alone. I'm like, just leave me alone. I am not good company right now. And I feel much better today. You know, I feel much better today. Uh, a good night's rest is um, sometimes the best healing that we can have. Um, so that's that. It's excellent time for self-care. Um, just focus on yourself and don't feel guilty about taking that time. It's so, so, so important. The best thing you can do for this world and the collective is not following gossipy truthers, is not watching the news and figuring out what's going on at what certain time in what certain country, that's not going to help anybody. What's going to help anybody is you healing yourself. If we all took the time to heal ourselves, the collective would move up yeah. a lot faster. A lot can we, faster. Can we pause on that for a second before we get into the rest of the astrological um, look at the month? Because we were chat chatting before we hit record and Stephanie and I spoke about this last night. And, um, and I do recommend I, Marnie Alton is one of my favorites. Um, I've done multiple bar, different bar classes, but she is by far the best in my opinion, because she understands energetic body and you, and for someone like me, that's spent almost 16 years studying energetic body. I can recognize that she has also studied this and the way she has you move your body is very, very much on purpose. And it's getting like I was telling you, Emmy, she got your bunda to activate. That's what you were feeling was that bunda activation, which is you said isn't really spoken about in Reiki, the bundas. Um, now, Stephanie and I were talking about this last night. And it's kind of this, I love how you said, like, it's not really a time for us to be like listening to gossipy YouTubers or, you know, getting more intel because most of the intel that's out there isn't real anyway. Because there's literally like five people that know what's going to happen. And that's how it has to be to keep it top secret, right? And so Stephanie and I were speaking about this with, with Marnie Alton, for example. She's not awake. She's not someone, she doesn't know that Mr. T is actually a good guy. She's not someone that oh, is aware of what's happening behind the scenes with some of these like elite people, okay? However, however, in my opinion... She is actually more awake than more truthers are. Even though she doesn't know the intel, she's fucking worked on herself. And she's very, she's, you know, we have these people in truther community that have all this intel, but yet they're lying. They're cheating. They're being mean. They're doxing people. They're fear mongering. That's low vibration. That's low vibration. That's not fourth density positive behavior. And then you have someone like Marnie Alton who isn't aware of the intel, but is coming every day to her, to her practices, to her clients, to her students from a place of genuine love and genuine, um, she's a stronghold for her students. She's helping them break through their own barriers. I mean, there have been some of her classes that I have taken where I'm sobbing after I'm done because of things that she has said while working on a particular part of the body. And even one of the classes, she said, um, we're not fully awake until we're in our body. Right. And to understand, and she talks about a lot in a lot of her classes about the dance between the darkness and the light, the, the, the darkness is necessary to understand the light. And so that's what I want to propose as you brought this up. Emmy is we have to stop thinking about, well, I'm awake because I know this, 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 and this about the world. But yet I'm going to be an asshole to people and I'm going to lie and I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to be violent and I'm going to threaten and I'm going to be fear, fear mongering instead of coming from a place of love. Then you have someone over here that doesn't know the, the facts about the world, but is coming from a place of love because they've worked on themselves. In my opinion, she is more awake than most of the truthers are. Mm -hmm. And even though she doesn't know that Mr. T is a good guy, she'll, I believe she'll be riding out this ascension with us. 
And I, if because of the work she's done on herself, if I had to guess, my speculation is the minute she realizes the truth, she's going to be able to step in and start helping because she's done so much work on herself that she can be that stronghold. And so I really want to encourage everybody watching right now, do not base yourself as being awakened because you know certain things about these islands or about these, you know, controllers. I'm trying to be careful what I say for YouTube. Base yourself on how awake you are about how much work you're doing on yourself. Are you a nice person? Are you coming to people with, from a place of love and a place of honesty? Are you working on yourself? Are you humble? That's what your vibration is, is rising up. The other stuff is just the details. Does that make sense? I don't know, Stephanie, if you want to add something to that or not. Being what we label red pill is a multi-layered, multi-dimensional, multi-layers of spirituality. Like it, it's all layers. And like when I first awakened to everything, it was just the facts, the tunnel systems and all that kind of stuff. And the, the really heartbreaking portion of what we're learning about what these powers that be do to young ones. Right. And I went through my own little dark night of the soul during that period. And then it was little tricklets of awakening with certain things like figuring out that the way the pastor has taught me about the Bible is not exactly the way it's actually written. It's their way and, and portraying it their way. And I took it into my own hands and brought my power back in by interpreting it my way. And then the next thing I know, I'm realizing, okay, well, this actually was written by probably Satanists. So I'm like, it, you're, it's like taking an onion and peeling back layer after layer after layer. There's layers to this. It's not just intel. It's not just the facts that are coming through. It's what are you doing with yourself? What work have you done to yourself? Don't just sit there watching video after video after video. If you're doing that, you're obviously escaping something. It's more or less, you have to figure out why did I choose to be born during this period of time? What do I have to do for myself to heal myself, to help myself grow spiritually in order to go forward helping others? You cannot help others if your cup is empty. You have to have a full cup in order to help others. This is the time of rest and reprieve and breaking through um, your own uh, matrices and your own illusions so that when the time comes, you can help others break through their own illusions and, and help them regain their own um, sovereignty and their own power. It's, it's all layers. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I want to I bring an example about too, like mean girl behavior, what we would call mean girl behavior. And it's really bothering me the fact that we find it of so interest, so much interest to figure out if someone was actually born a man or a woman. First of all, a lot of these peoples and these, these controlling groups of people, if they were changed as a child and they don't know they were changed, that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. And they need our, our compassion and our empathy. First of all, when you see these people labeling these people as either being born male or female, that's mean. That's really, really mean. And I'm going to give you an example of this. People have said that Kate Middleton was born not a Kate we'll say, trying to be careful what I say on YouTube. Well, there are, and they, they're looking at the cards, which cards are never going to tell you this anyway, right? They're, it's not a crystal ball. It's just cards. Well, there's certain um, biological markers on a human body that can't be changed. Even if you change one of them being the collarbones. And the other day I was watching some footage over the funeral and I noticed that she had a, a outfit on that showed her collarbones. And I thought that's interesting she has female collarbones. My collarbones are female. You can see them. Female collarbones go up into a V, up into the shoulder. You see that? That's a female collarbone. I was born a female, obviously. I'm the girliest of girls that you'll ever meet. <laughs> um, that's a female collarbone. It goes up to my shoulder. Male collarbones go out to the side. You can't change that. And so I'm thinking about Kate Middleton and how many people have started these rumors. And I think regardless of whether she's a good person or a bad person, I think I'm sitting there thinking how fucking mean, how cruel, how shameful. 
that us who consider ourselves to be awakened are contributing to this mean girl, vile, abusive, narcissistic behavior. We're no better than the people we point fingers at on the other side mm. who are shaming people for not getting this or shaming people for not doing this. We're no better when we behave that way. How dare us? And let's say Kate was born a male and switched over as a baby. She did not consent to that. That wasn't her choice. Also being a divinator myself, you should not be divinating for gossip purposes. Mm -mm. No, and that's low, low vibrational. Yeah. And we should not be channeling anybody without their consent. I don't know how many times we got to say that. So I know there's still people who are very, they're, they're having a hard time understanding this concept. I'm not just going to go bust into someone. Else. I'm not going to go bust into Bryce's medical files. Now, Bryce showed me a blood test of hers and said, hey, Steph, I know you know a lot about blood tests. What do you think about this? And I said, you know, and I looked at it with her consent. I'm not just going to go through her medical files and pull out. Let's say, let's say I was your medical assistant, Bryce. You know, I, I roomed you or something. Are you Emmy? You know, you gave me consent being the patient. But if I was a medical assistant for another doctor and I had access to your records and I snooped in those records and got caught, I'd get fired right on the spot without any questions. You know what I mean? It's the same exact thing. It's breaking confidentiality um, in somebody's private life. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a violation. It's a universal violation. So nobody should be doing that with the cards. Not to mention, are we trying to get away from this whole gossip type of you know, programming that we've been in. Yeah. That's, and I was like, that's high school behavior. It's middle school behavior. I think, I think your, your teenager is more grounded when it comes to some of the adult truthers out there that are in, and, and what, what are mean girls? What are mean people? They're projecting their own issues onto somebody else. So when you're engaging in this behavior and that's the only thing you'll watch is these, these gossip channels, you're, you're avoiding working on yourself. It's like we know bullies abuse people because they don't want to deal with their own shit. So you've become a bully that won't a, a deal with your own shit. What does it matter? I've said this so many time and time again. First of all, I don't care what sex someone was born as. It has nothing to do with my own relationship with God and my own spirituality. What I care about are their crimes. And those will be presented in a court of law. And none of the, the other stuff isn't any of my business. All right. And so I wanted to, but I mean, I, I really, it, I, I watch these channels on narcissism a lot and I watch on psych, psych, psychology is very fascinating to me. And the biggest thing that therapists look for is empathy. If someone cannot display empathy, just cannot do it, then we have a problem. Mm -hmm. They're either a narcissist or a psychopath or a sociopath. So I, everybody watching right now, I want you to sit there for a moment. How would you feel? How would you feel if someone you didn't know was publicly pulling cards on you and saying that you were not born the sex you were born? How would you feel? Probably not that great. And so that should dictate the way we treat other people. Do and That's one of the good things in the Bible. It says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's empathy. That's empathy. And so I, I really, I, I, I'm getting, it's, it's getting kind of, it's kind of pissing me off a little bit because it's just, it's, it's, we're no different. The people and, and Ricardo Bozzi spoke about this. We need to come from a place of love. If we're, if we think we're better than the people who are asleep, then we need to act that way. We need to act that way. We need to work on ourselves. We need to be loving. We need to be compassionate. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that we are, are all just walking each other home. Right. When the time comes, we should not be out in the streets sailing at others saying, I told you so. That is absolutely the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be holding these people in our arms while they cry on our shoulder and um, being compassionate and loving to them because their souls chose not to wake up before everything. And how scary is it going to be for those people to be shaken and aroused awake so suddenly like it's like when you're in the middle of 
this really, really deep sleep and your little kid comes out in the middle of the night and shakes you awake and scares the living bejesus out of you, um, it's, it's going to be, they're going to be shaken to wake and they're not going to have all this time that we've had to process things. So we do need to show love and compassion toward those people. That's one of the reasons why we came here for this time is to show compassion for those people. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, before that happens, um, we need to better ourselves. We need to definitely step up and stop being the gossipy, um, non-compassionate, bitchy yeah. <laughs> people that we've been programmed to be. So our first, you need to bust out of these programs. We're, we're programmed to be mean. We're programmed to not have compassion. We're programmed to judge others. We really need to break free of that. That's, again, another programming that we need to really bust out of. Yeah. And again, I just bring it back to how would you feel? How would you feel if you were Kate Middleton? Yeah. How would you feel? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Practice your empathy. It doesn't take, I mean, if you're a narcissist or a psychopath, you're not going to be able to understand that. But if you're a normal human being with a soul, you're going to have that realization. And, I, and I, I know that the two ladies on my screen right now have empathy. And I know most of my viewers have empathy. I get your emails. I read your emails. Most of the people watching right now are so beautiful and so have amazing hearts. And so we just need to, and that's, that's the thing too. It's like this war, in the beginning of this war, this was an information war. But the overall crux of this war is that it's a spiritual war. And if we're looking at spirituality, we're looking at vibrational frequency. So it doesn't matter what you know in your head. What matters is the vibration you're carrying within your soul and your body. So if you know shit in your head, but you're gossiping and you're just watching these low vibrational shows, then you're not evolving. You're staying in a low vibration. But if you're taking the, the, the information you get, you're working through it, you're having your dark night of the soul, and then you're stepping aside to work on yourself, then guess what? You're doing the work and you're raising your vibration. Yeah. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm getting red because this me. really upsets me. Like this really upsets me. Um, this mean girl. Mm -hmm. I am, I will be 40 years old in February of, of 2023. And I have seen people behave worse in this truth or community than they did with than, than high schoolers and middle schoolers are behaving right now. There are 12 year olds out, 12 year old girls out there that have more empathy and compassion than some of the people in this truth or community who are 40 years old, 50 years old. Yeah. When we don't, when we don't work on our inner child, that inner child is what comes forth to people. So if we're stuck in ego and, and we can be red pilled and still be stuck very much in spiritual ego. Like if you have ever felt the need to say to someone, well, don't you know, don't you know this, that, and the other? That's very, it's coming from a place of, of ego. If when we can transcend that and look upon all people, no matter what they do, think, say, or believe, and see them as God sees us as, as a perfect being who just has a lot of disharmony at this time, if we can see them as God sees them, the inconsistencies in our beliefs won't really matter. It, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and so I think a lot of, of these people who have um, inner child, inner children that aren't healed, that's what's coming forth. It's, it's because it's such a touchy subject because, you know, I, I don't, I know we're preaching to the choir here. And I don't want to point fingers like our audiences are, are behaving this way. I know that probably a lot of people that watch us watch these other things, other channels too. And that's fine. You know, wherever you're at is fine. We're, we're always in the right place at the right time with the right people doing and saying the right things. And if you adopt that philosophy and believe that, you can accept wherever you are at this, this point in time and love yourself. And, and be able to love others where they're at and not, not come at them and say, well, don't you know? Don't you know that she did this? Don't you know that he does that? 
that stuff is 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 completely irrelevant um, when we're looking at things from a place of spiritual growth. Facts and details and intel and things that are going on or things that are not going on is is really quite irrelevant. It's about healing our healing our bodies, our trauma, so that we can completely descend into this body and completely be in our body. And then we can ascend. And I think so, so many people could be helped if all of these channels who are presenting intel and information would just encourage people to work on themselves. The world is not going to change until we change. The best thing we can do is heal ourselves. In fact, that's the only thing that's going to, um, I want to say cause, but that's the only thing that's going to facilitate this ascension Mm -hmm. is healing ourselves. No amount of intel, no amount of red pilling, no amount of knowing this or knowing that is going to help us ascend. Yes, it's helpful knowing what the world really is like because we've been lied to about everything. So it helps to be aware. Awareness is is very important. But until we take ownership and responsibility of the things that need to be healed in us. And another thing, whatever bothers you about another person is what needs to be healed in you. Whatever is triggering you, whatever is making you angry, take a look at that within yourself. Um, Because the whole physical 3D reality is a mirror to show us what we need to work on. So, you know, if, if I'm super irritated by what someone from my husband's family says to me, Instead of pointing fingers at that person, oh, you made me so mad, you know, how dare you? Um, I try to, and, and it's hard to catch. It's really hard to catch and turn it around on yourself and take ownership of that and responsibility because we forget. We're not taught how to do this stuff. So once we learn how to do it and we start practicing it, we still forget. We still forget. I had something happen just recently. Um where I tried to make amends to uh, an in-law and it backfired because she can't see my perspective. She can only see herself. She's an active addiction right now. She took what I was saying um, as I was trying to guilt trip her. And that was not my intention, but that's all she can see because that's what needs to be healed in her. Does that make sense? So it's like, whatever bothers you, instead of pointing fingers at the person and making them responsible for how you feel. Go inward. Okay, what is it that I, did I do something like this to someone and that's triggering me and pointing this out to me? Or do I, do I have an issue with such and such? You know, is, is there some kind of attachment or belief in lack or belief in control that I need to look at? Um, just start noticing those things. And when you can notice them and become aware of them, then you have the ability and the power to do something about it and to take action. And the sooner that we can take ownership and responsibility for everything that happens in our life, the sooner we can ascend and the sooner we can bring in this golden age. It's not about anybody else. It's about you. Can I say something real quick? I, um, I just want to put out there too, don't wait for med bed to fix you either Mm. because med beds will meet you only where you are vibrationally. It's not a one time fix all and then you're good to go. You still have to work on yourself. Yeah. Um, And a lot of people, and I was guilty of doing this when I first awakened to everything, um, are just waiting for that magical med bed. And the the reality is if you're low vibrational, it's not going to do anything for you. You have to, you have to raise your vibration. You have to work on yourself. If you want those, the, these new technologies to meet you um, in a space where it's, it's really going to help you. You really have to still work on yourself regardless. So I wanted to mention that really quick because there is this misconception out there that this is the 
heal all, fix all. You don't have to do any work on yourself kind of a thing. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with you. It makes me so mad when people are like, oh, I'll lose weight in the med bed. No, you won't. No, mm -hmm. you won't. It's the whole savior mentality. Yeah. People are waiting for someone to come in and make it better and save them. And I'm guilty of that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain things that I have put off and it's like, I'll just wait until, you know, blah, -de blah happens. No. If, if I see something and notice something in myself, I have to take ownership of that. I take responsibility for that. That's my shit. It's my shit and I need to work on it. Nobody's going to heal it for me. I mean, I spent so much of my life. Help me, help me, help me. What do I do? What do I do about this? And, and, and that's fine. If that's where you are, that's fine. That's, it. that's where you're supposed to be. But when you can get over that hump, over that mountain, and take ownership and responsibility for absolutely everything. If, if you're hurt by someone, the law of attraction, the law of karma, the law of reaping and sowing, it's all the same thing. What goes around comes around, all the same thing. Take a look at your past and see if there was an area where you may have done that to someone else because everything comes full circle. You know, it, it's, it's very empowering and very liberating when you can take ownership of everything in your life. Um, you know, it's a little bit different for children when they go through trauma because they don't have a choice. They don't have any control over themselves or their lives. So that's a little bit different. But as we grow into adults, it's still our responsibility to go back to those childhood wounds and do things to heal that child, heal that inner child, be your own parent, read parenting books and parent yourself. And I'm not kidding. I know that sounds funny to some people, but if we don't know how to parent, read a book, parent yourself. Even if you've had no, no children, you know, read a parenting book, how to parent yourself. I, I was a huge fan of attachment parenting and all of my children are very, very independent today because of all of their needs be, and I'm not a perfect mom. I've made so many mistakes, but Addressing their needs and being there and, and nurturing the child is so incredibly important for their future mental health. You'll have a very independent, healthy person as an adult if they had their needs met as a child. And if you didn't have your needs met as a child and you don't know how to parent, read a book on parenting. Parent yourself. I parented my inner child for like two years until she was healthy enough to integrate into this grown-up person. And it was incredibly freeing and liberating. And there were so many times when I just bawled my eyes out, picturing myself holding myself as a child. Don't worry, I've got you now. I'm getting all emotional, think about it, because it's such a beautiful experience. It's such a beautiful experience when you can take the reins and have power, not power like power over someone or something, but power over your own life. And you can give yourself what it is that you need. Because when you can give yourself what it is that you need, you don't need it from anybody else. You're not looking for it in anyone else. I have a story. A couple of years ago, my husband um, did something that was really hurtful and I was sulking and I was really bitter about it. And I, I was doing some meditation and I bought myself a bouquet of flowers and I did for myself what I wanted him to do for me. And that was the most significant bouquet of flowers I've ever gotten was ones that I, I bought for myself. So if you can do for yourself what you need from other people, you won't need it from other people. And then you're free to be able to give that to everyone else. You know, I, Aaron Abke says, I only lack what I don't give. That's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, we, we kind of got into some really deep stuff, didn't we? <laughs> well, my therapist did the same thing with me about taking care of the little girl. Uh, I ended up in trauma therapy because I 
had gone through a string of abusive relationships, almost lost my life one night, long story, but I ended up in trauma therapy. And that was one of the best things that ever happened to me because we had to wind it back to my childhood. And, um, and she kept saying, you're now responsible for taking care of the little girl who wasn't taken care of as a child. And there's a story out to, I'll give another story too, of how, of how easy this is to do. Sorry, guys, my nose is running like crazy again. Um, when I, I, when I was doing EMDR therapy, I had to think of a time when I was a ch- small child, when I, when I, re- if you remembered something from childhood, there's a reason why you remembered it. And this was a time where I had gotten wounded. Um, I remember being in the car with my dad. My dad was driving. I was probably like eight or nine years old. I was sitting in the front seat because back in the dark ages, we didn't have bo- booster seats for, you know, you just sat in the front seat. And I remember telling my dad something about what I wanted to do when I was a grown up, and I was really excited about it. And I remember where we were on Turn of McCall Boulevard. I remember exactly we were passing the movie theater. It's in my mind. And I was telling my dad about what I wanted to do. And all my dad said, he just goes, no, you won't. You won't do that. No, you won't. But that was what my dad did a lot to us. Dad, I'm cold. No, you're not. Dad, I'm hungry. No, you're not. Dad, I don't like this food. No, yes, you do. And so that was a huge wound for me as a child. And my therapist said to me, because I'm an aunt, I have a nephew and nieces at that point, just a nephew and a niece. My youngest niece wasn't born yet. And my therapist said to me, okay, as an adult, if you were driving in the car and your nephew said that to you about what he wanted to do when he was a grown up, how would you respond to it? And I, I said, I'd be like, that sounds so exciting, Charlie. That sounds so exciting. I hope that you get to do that one day. That is so cool. And she goes, okay, now say that to yourself. Mm-hmm. Say that to, to your little girl as you as that little girl that got wounded by her dad because her dad basically dismissed what she wanted to do. Mm-hmm. It's that easy. And, and which when, my, when the therapist said that to me, I was like, oh, that makes sense. So go back. Every time where I was wounded, how would I as an adult handle that to my niece and nephew and then say that to myself as a child? Yes. Right? Yes. And then you could also go um, a step further too and look at your dad and have empathy and compassion for your dad because he probably had the same thing done to him. And that's why he did what he did. Oh, yeah. He had his own dreams crushed and was possibly got slit as a child. And so that's what, you know, when, especially for men, it's really difficult. Uh, getting in touch with emotions and being able to express emotions as a man, because any kind of emotion other than anger is often unacceptable to a man. So because they're not able to express those feelings like fear and sadness and grief, they're not allowed to express those as a child. They grow up thinking that those emotions aren't okay. And then everything comes out as anger. You know, it's a very common theme in a lot of men that they're just not able to have and feel and express these kinds of emotions because when they grew up, it wasn't acceptable. It wasn't okay. You know, a a parent a lot of the times doesn't know how to handle or doesn't know what to do when a child is afraid or sad. And when they're screaming and crying and causing distress, the parent just wants the distress to stop. So they, you know, send them away. They don't teach them how to process this emotion. They don't say it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. However, we should express it like this, not like this, and then give them examples of things to do. But a person can't do that unless they've done that, the the work themselves. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be chain breakers. I'm sure we have all had instances where we've been told that a certain emotion is not okay, you know, and, and not, maybe not told that directly, but that was implied through the reaction that our parents had, you know, it was, it's implied that, okay, it's not okay for me to be sad or afraid because I get in trouble. I have to go spend my time alone with my feelings when I'm that because, okay, so that's not okay for me to feel that way. It's okay for me to be, you know, mad, dad gets mad. It's okay for me to be mad. So then they cover up and hide and stuff all of these emotions that really need to be expressed in a healthy manner and cover it with anger. Yeah. 
I used uh, to get in trouble as a kid. I had said this once. Um, I don't know on camera if it was off camera. I used to get in trouble all the time. I know Stephanie, we've talked about this as a child for standing up for myself. So like if I express something that I like, if I, um, like I hate it, I, I loathe the school that I went to the high school, not the middle school or the lower school, but the high school, the upper school, I loathed it. It was this very ex- preppy private school. I drove Stephanie through it. There was shit going on there. I was very much abused there and I loathed it. And I would try to talk to my parents about it, but there was like this kind of this wall. And I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and say, I've, I've talked with this off, had a memory come up when I was, um, I talked to Stephanie about it. When I was 15 years old, I, and I forgot what it's called, Stephanie, when your uterus falls out, what's it called? Oh, um, it's a prolapsed uterus. I had a prolapsed uterus at 15 I re- or 14, 15. I remember it. I remember the feeling of it starting to, to fall out through my lady bits. And um, my mother took me to the pediatrician because I was still going to the pediatrician at that time. I think I, I loved my pediatrician. I would still go to my pediatrician, even though I'm 39. Um, but, and I remember her actually saying to my mom, they had to push it back in, my uterus back in. And the, the pediatrician saying to my mom, like, this is a sign, and I'm going to have to bleep this word out, well, of um, sexual, we'll just say misconduct with a child. At this point, I was a virgin. And I don't, my mother very much dismissed it, didn't do anything about it, was just very much like, nope, she couldn't handle it. We just went about our lives. And these memories are starting to come back now. And I remember in trauma therapy, my my, um, therapist saying, you do show signs of somebody who was inappropriately, we'll just say touched when you were smaller. I have to be careful what I say on YouTube. And even though the memory is not super clear, I'm showing the signs of that. And so what I realized, especially even still going through it now at 39, is that when these traumas were happening and the people in my life that were supposed to protect me were protecting themselves instead, I, from the reality, I started to um, interpret that as that I don't matter. Me as, and of course, having my dad dismiss us I walked into, I walked through life thinking I don't matter. I deserve the short end of the stick. I deserve the crappy situation. I don't deserve the raise at my job. I deserve to work 80 hours a week and get no pay. I deserve, I, that's why I was in and out of all these abusive relationships because that's how I understood love was abuse. And it took me literally getting to the point where I almost lost my life one night I was strangled one night from an ex um, that put me into trauma therapy that I started to untangle what's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's why it's complex. It's not post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is from like one event Mm -hmm. that the complex is that it's layered, it's layered. And so having to untangle all that, and it's something I know that I'm going to be working on for the rest of my life. And I still have a hard time standing up for myself. I still have struggle with that. Like I have actually like, how dare I stand up for myself? I mean, proof uh, the point was proven just a couple weeks ago when I tried to stand up for myself and fix my AdSense and look what happened. Right. And so we're still struggling and we're still having as human beings to work through these things, you know, and, and when we ignore them, when we don't work through them, we stay stuck. We stay in that hanged man position and we have to just keep. And the beautiful thing about God and our souls is that our souls are eternal. There's no finish line. So God doesn't care how long it's going to take you to figure this out. You'll just keep reliving life after life, after life, and after life until you actually finally do it. So why not do it in this life? Why not just do it? Why not just work on yourself? Because it's going to follow you from life. After. It, it doesn't matter how much you know about the truth of the matrix. And, and let's be honest, guys, like, you know, my dad's dad used to say, like, the only person you can control is yourself. That's it. There's nothing we can do as an individual, as Bryce. There's nothing I can do about what was happening on those islands. I can't do anything about the past. I can't change the past. We know that that, that stuff is still happening. It hasn't stopped. It's still going on. It's not as bad as it was, but it is still going on. But there are people who are trained to deal with it. But what can I do as Bryce? What can I do is me. I can work on myself. I can heal myself. And it's like uh, Catherine said this once. It's like those vibrating 
forks. When one vibrating fork, tuning fork is up here, the one down here is naturally going to start to rise as well. And so if everybody watching just took the time to just, just you're never going to be finished working yourself, but just the fact that you start, you get that ball rolling and say today you sit down, you say, I'm just going to journal about something that happened to you know, as a child. You've started that ball rolling and guess what? Your vibration is already starting to rise and it's going to affect your spouse. It's going to affect your neighbor. That's the power you have. And collectively, if we all started doing that, we won't have to. I mean, I said this in the last episode and, and Ricardo Bozzi said this as well. Yes, there are certain events that are scheduled to happen. But as far as when we actually flip, it depends on us. It depends on when we wake up, really wake up. Mm -hmm. Not just waking up to this or this or that, but to wake up to us, to who we are, descending into ourselves. And maybe that's why some of the infiltrator truthers are doing gossip tarot shows because they don't want you to, to heal yourself. Think about it that way. They want to distract you over here so that you don't do the work over here that you need to do. So take mm -hmm. your power back. That's one thing Stephanie and I have been, uh, I've known Jesse's a voter for a while now, and she's become such a good friend during this time to me. And actually I have to show you, I meant to show this. Jesse just sent me this. It's amazing. Thank you, Jesse. I'm going to figure out a way to put it back here. You see the girl, the lion, and she's got her dress on and her boots on because she's going to war. So I'm going to find a place. Thank you, Jesse. And I'll put Jesse's links down in the description box below guys for her website. Such but a cool um, picture. It is a very <laughs> cool picture. Um, so thank you, Jesse. That meant a lot to me. And your card was very sweet. I cried when I read it this morning. Um, but, you know, we've been working a lot with Jesse and even she has you do that right through our work. Where are your wounds? Where? Because that's where the darkness has permission to come in. Wherever your wounds are, they're using that as permission to come in. And so every single night before I go to bed, I call back. I actually say, no, you don't have permission to manipulate or use any of my wounds, the ones that I'm aware of and the ones that I'm not even aware of. You cannot use them. And I, every night I sit there and I call back my soul. I call back my soul. I call back every essence of my soul that has been used and abused and wounded. And I call back my blood. I call that back as well. And, and I call my power back. And if I could, and, and even if everybody watching tonight, just before you go to bed tonight, just sit on bed and close your eyes and say, I call back my soul. I call it back. I call it back. Because every time, in my opinion, every time someone hurts us, we drop a little bit of our essence. Every time we don't stand up for ourselves, we drop a little bit of our essence. Every time we engage in a destructive behavior like gossip or you know, whatever, we drop a little bit of our essence. And so if we start to call that back into us, we call that sovereignty back. Every night we call it back. What a difference that would make in the world. I did that the other day. I mean, well, not the other day, about three weeks ago. I felt so pulled by different people I'm close to in my life. Um, one person's telling me to think this way and one person is telling me this way. And it got to the point where it was distracting me from what I need to do. And I knew that it was happening because I had to recognize something within me. And that was allowing people, even those that I love the most to manipulate how I think and act and what I say and do. And it's like, I had to take back my power. So I have those, those Reiki candles and this one was specifically for power and I lit it and I did like a half an hour prayer calling in my soul, calling back my power, anybody who has purposely or non-purposely taken a, a, a piece of my essence um, throughout my life. And my life has completely um, done a 180 since I did that. Um, I actually have been able to stand up for myself a lot more confident than I could. Um, in addition to that, when I do stand up for myself, I, I have the bad habit of being passive aggressive because I take, 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 and then I explode. And now I can address things right on the spot. I don't take, take, take anymore. I just address it when it needs to be addressed right from the beginning. So it doesn't turn into this big, massive explosion. Um, of me getting angry because that was something I desperately needed to work on. I've been praying to God to help me with that part of who I am for years. I've 
always known that's a big weakness in me is just as an empath, just taking and taking and taking. And all of a sudden I can't take anymore. And I just like a ticking time B O M B. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's one thing I have desperately tried to work on myself and there was a lot of trial and error with it. But when I said that to myself and I still say it, it's not that one time I constantly have to re remind myself. Um, it's made a big impact just saying those words. Um, you know, our words are spell cast, whether they're good or bad, right? What, what, what's the intention behind it? So it's funny that, you know, the church tells you not to cast spells, but our words are spell castings. <laughs> Prayers for spells. Prayers spells, right? But the thing is, I'm, I'm taking back my power. And the thing is, too, it's like when you are constantly escaping from something and giving your power over to a TV screen or not saying that watching TV is is bad altogether. You know, sometimes we do need that little bit of a distraction once in a while when it's becoming a really like extreme habit and it's taking away from you working on yourself. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, obviously, like Bryce, you watch Real Housewives when you need to escape it. for two seconds. Yes. You know, my escapism is is my piano playing. And that's another part that I've really had to work on is I remember as a fourth grader, I was the worst flute player in the class for approximately a week. Couldn't get a sound out of that damn thing. And I remember the moment I made a sound out of it, I remember I, I was never good at sight reading. I put my headphones on one day and I'm going to get made fun of so bad. I really don't care though. I have an obsession with soundtrack music, but at that time it was Star Wars soundtrack music. And I would play nine hours a day in the summertime to my flute with my headphones, my ears just playing along to the entire soundtrack. That's, that's what I would do. That was my escapism as a child. I didn't play the video games. I wasn't into TV. That was what I did. I had no life except for that and being outside because I was outside a lot too. And I remember going into the classroom and being so proud of myself that I learned all these songs. And I had all these girls looking at me like mean girls, right? And they would put me down. And so I stopped showing the teacher what I could do because I thought I was showing off. I wasn't trying to be show offy at all. There was no major ego behind it. It was like I was proud of myself because I had never understood how to be proud of myself up until then. You know, I had gone through a lot of things in my um, very, very young years that were not healthy for any child to go through at all. And so this was something that really was helping me become me. Like it was, it was like boosting me up. And then when those girls did that, it really brought me to a place of complete despair and hating myself once again. And then I got into piano playing and I remember saying to my the mother who raised me, she's not my biological mother. Hey ma, I, I wrote a song on the piano and I was so excited to show her. And all she said was, that's okay. It's not the greatest. And ever since then, I have a hard time playing in front of anybody. I have had moments where I just want to quit. And that's something I've had to work on with myself. Um, I've had a couple of people in my life say, oh my God, you're amazing at it. But no amount of words help because it's not my mom. So she does not realize that one day what she did to me. And I do feel sorry for her because... I don't think she realizes, I don't think she meant it on purpose, but that was, that was traumatizing for me, that one little sentence. And so that's something I've had to work on with myself is, does Stephanie like her own music? Do I, can I, do I like the music I've created? And ever since then, I've actually had a hard time even writing music because I used to write music all the time and make up songs and everything. So now I'm trying to get myself back into that and go, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of the song. How do I like it? Do I love what I created? Same goes for my art, my paintings and my jewelry and all that kind of stuff. And it comes from that, that wound that happened back when I was in sixth grade or eighth grade. Yeah. Eighth grade. Yeah. But you recognize it. And that's the, that's yeah. part of healing is recognizing it. And you're right. I mean, when you start to look at like, where your parents wombs are i mean with my father's situation like here he is 
in his sixties now, and he doesn't have a relationship with his children. Mm. He barely sees his grandchildren. So obviously there's something with him that, that you, you have to detach that. Like he treated your mom treated you that way. My dad treated me this way because of something with them. And it was projected onto you as a child. And as a child, I think too, as children, we see our parents as being almost like superheroes. Like if mom and dad say this is right, then it's right. And there comes this point where we have to realize that our parents are just people. They're just mm -hmm. humans and they mess up a lot. And, um, and that's their path to walk. Um, that's their journey. And, you know, I was, I was always the weird kid too. Um, you know, I think we all, all of us watching can, I always had paranormal experiences and, um, I don't think my, even though that's very common in the South, I don't think my parents, I talked about it a lot. Um, no one really wanted to, they, to really address it. You know, they just kind of left me off to the side to deal with it by myself. And, um, but that was their issue. That's their fear. At this point at 39 years old, not much scares me when it comes to the paranormal anymore. I'll sleep in a haunted house, no problem. Because I've, you know, so, so then we look at like, okay, well, what's the journey? You know, you're an incredible artist, Stephanie. I've seen your painting. I've seen, you know, and you've gone through that journey of self-discovery again. Sometimes as we spoke about last time, that friction, that darkness is what propels us to actually move through the journey of that self-discovery too. I actually yeah. create masterpieces in my darkness. Yeah. That's when I paint the best. That's when I create really emotional music on piano um, is through that darkness. And without that darkness, I would not have the appreciation for. Honestly, without darkness, we would not appreciate the light. No. Because we wouldn't right. understand the polarity, the duality of everything. Right. It helps us actually start to uh, like like I said to you Bryce um, on a show we did last week um, I had said that um, because I have lacked really good friends in my life and this goes for you too Emmy like because I lack good friends in my life and I've always had friends really just use and abuse me kind of a thing just they they get what they want out of the relationship and just kind of take off and I, I lacked those boundaries for myself and everything. And I kept calling in friends that were not for my highest good. Now that I really have true friends, I appreciate, I appreciate the fact that I have true friends now versus if I never went through that heartache. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. It teaches you so much about honor and respect and integrity. When you, when you lack that, when you go without that, when you absolutely, and I feel the same way about you girls as well. I feel like I could call you about anything and it would, you know, I trust both of you with my life, you know, I know the things I, I tell you guys, you're not going to repeat that. It's going to, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's even Marnie Alton said um, once in our classes, and I'm paraphrasing, we know when the sperm hits the egg, there's a spark of light, right? Mm -hmm. That's the divine spark. But then that divine spark nestles into the dark womb, womb for nine months. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You said wound. Wound. Yes. The wound. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I, I think they're, I don't know about you guys, but lately I have really felt this very um, intense presence of the need to heal this mother wound, you know, generationally and ancestrally. Um, just because the divine feminine has been so suppressed and we've, we've been living in this um, toxic masculinity, like might is right, you know, and that's, no. And it, I think a lot of uh, twin flame unions too, the divine feminine is being activated first. Mm -hmm. And I have it, a book on that, actually. <laughs> I have a book I, on that. I'll tell you too, because I just did the reading for next week for the, the divine or return of the divine Sophia. And I've said this before. Yeah. So when you said this is toxic masculinity, because what's happened is if you take the divine feminine away, you're also taking the divine masculine away too, because the divine masculine and the divine feminine work together as one. And when a divine masculine is in his proper attunement and alignment, he's going to be sensitive. He's going to be caring and strong at the same time. So he's going to be able to sit and play tea party with his little girl and then get up and, and protect his family at the same time. Yeah. And the same thing for women, because we carry both energies too. A woman can be the intuitive. That's why I love this picture so much. Like how divine feminine is that? Mm -hmm. Right? I'll turn the light up for a second so you guys can see. 
like she's got her pretty dress on, but then she's got those Doc Martens on where she's going to go to war. Mm -hmm. right, there's a lion right there. That's why I like it. Cause like that, that feels like me. Like I yeah. can be that intuitive, very girly. I like my sparkles. I like my polka dots, but boy, I can play in the mud. You know, like we do have that, that equal um, energy and it, the whole toxic masculinity it's also a distorted masculine. So it's like that aggressive Mars type energy feeling where they've taken out that masculine energy with that's softer or, or the, or society has overly softened the male to where they're too much of the other. Does that make sense? Um, and so it, it's like, there's no balance And the, the thing that I've been actually getting in the cards with my collective readings is the balancing of these two energies. I don't know if you guys have been watching my collective readings, but I've been getting a lot of this balance between the two energies that is more healthy and more sufficient to go forward. And, and that they're working simultaneously together as a team and no more trying to break apart, dividing, destroying everything Lucifer does. So what I really said, interesting, you're getting that. Sorry, Bryce. I just want to say this. It's really interesting. You're getting that in the cards because that's what's going on with um, our communication plan at Mercury is in Libra. Libra is all about balance. And if we have balance with our communication, um, yeah, that it's so cool to have. Um, so cool to have different means of intuition support each other support what's going on collectively mm -hmm. what's going on astrologically and everything is connected yes but do you know yeah. why the woman activates first why because because it starts from the woman so when a when a, a, a the sperm hits the egg and this is in the divine sophia which I'm, and i also knew this i was reminded because i remember studying this in science when the embryo first exists it exists as female yep that's why men have nipples also, the mother Sophia births out the soul. It's not the male form of God that births out the soul. It's the feminine mother. part, the mother of God that births out the soul when your soul is birthed. Because you go through a soul birth first before you're physically born into whatever realm you go into. And that is in the book. I can't reach it right now because I'm a little short. I need a ladder. Step stool. Um, it's called Twin Flames in the Event Book, I believe, is the book I read it in. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it might be, is it in the Sophia Code too? I believe it is in the Sophia Code. Well, Magdalene Manuscript talks about that, that Magdalene actually um, activated Yahshua. But it's because the female was first. The female came first. We and that's why they're removing out of this throughout this luciferian time period as they they've removed that and it doesn't mean the masculine isn't as important no. it's got a different role to play and both roles when done correctly work harmoniously in you know vibrationally speaking and and just every part of life really um you got to have that 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 balance so that is interesting that you said mercury is in libra right mm -hmm. And I'm a Libra, and so I know all about balance. So, <laughs> well, okay. Before we get back to the ask, so this is something that came up in the it's in the Apocryphon books, which are the missing books of the Bible. And I also spoke about it when I was reading the Divine Sophia in my recording. And I know people are going to get pissy about this. And if you get pissy, just figure out why it's triggering you so much because this is actually in the Apocryphon books that were taken out of the Bible. The Garden of Eden, according to the Apocryphon books, was a jail. It was Lucifer's jail. So the snake was kundalini that eve activated the kundalini which then she activated adam eve comes from coming from adam's rib cage to me says they were twin souls they were of the same soul and two that's a it's a metaphor of two feminine masculine from the same soul kundalini activation happened for eve first because she's the female she activated adam and then they were able to leave the confat the confines of the matrix this is what the Apocryphon books teach from the Bible. This is why they were taken out of the Bible. And the Apocryphon books also talk about Sophia as well. All right. So that's why Kundalini 
you know, we see that represented as the snake and people are like, oh, the snake is bad. The snake is bad. But first of all, God created snakes too, just like he created goats and owls. They've been inverted by this group, just like everything else has been inverted by this group. But what if the snake always represented the Christ consciousness, that Kundalini rising? It's just a thought. It's just yep. a thought. And if it tri that triggers you, okay, where are you programmed? Where, why is that triggering you? Why can't you just entertain an idea without accepting it? Right? So, um, so anyway, but let's get back. So what else is happening astrologically? I know we took a little detour there. We're just gonna let <laughs> Yeah, my gosh, it's been an hour. <laughs> well, when when Emmy's all set, I pulled a bunch of cards here. So I can go into the energies after she's done. Well, okay. you want to quickly wrap it up? So I know you have somewhere to be Emmy. So yes. Okay. So the other thing I want to talk about astrologically is a, um, a square. It's not an exact square, but let's, let's just refresh what a aspect of a square is. Um, the square aspects and the opposition aspects are very activating. It's motivating. It's about achievement. They get a negative rap because, um, it, it creates this tension and this drive within us, okay? And that can be seen as disharmonious because it's uncomfortable. It is basically lighting a fire our, under our butts and it causes us to achieve something, to grow, to do something, to take action. So those are the square and the opposition aspects are our achievement aspects. So you've got Saturn, which is the retrograde in Aquarius right now. And um, you have Uranus, which is also retrograde in Taurus. And they're, they're making an almost square. And they come uh, as close to the square as possible between September 23rd and October 23rd. And let's just think about the themes for a minute of each of these planets. So... Saturn is all about control, stru control structures, the matrix, government, authority, that kind of stuff. Uranus is about swift moving change, throwing a monkey wrench into it, doesn't care about traditions, doesn't care about beliefs. It's like change now. So you've got the matrix and you've got swift moving change. So from the end of this month to the end of October, I would expect the unexpected with the matrix, with government, with control, with authority, with all of those kinds of themes in the world, expect the unexpected. I, th I think there may be a bit of a shakeup that we're, we're not really contemplating at the moment. So I have no idea what it is. Neither does Bryce or Stephanie, but I think something, um, something a bit shaken up is, is about to come down the pike. So and and there are six planets in retrograde right now and holy shit yeah six you've got neptune and pisces which um uh, it, it's in its its ruling sign and neptune is all about um spirituality and dreams and the dream world and so is pisces and so when you have a planet in its sign in retrograde it's just really digging into that stuff so that makes sense along with uh, what's going on with all of the spirituality and the spiritual changes and the upheaval and, and the growth and the development. Um, Saturn is a retrograde in Aquarius. Uh, Uranus is retrograde in Taurus. Mercury is retrograde in Libra. Um, Jupiter is retrograde in Aries and Pisces. It's like it's in Aries right now, but it's going to go back to Pisces before it goes direct again. And Jupiter is all about abundance and growth and expansion. And when we have it in the sign of Aries, which is very explosive, fiery energy. So if you just think about all of these themes working together simultaneously, all of them in retrograde, which is like a slowdown, a shakeup, a, a, a mix up, um, I, I just kind of anticipate something major coming down the pike in, in the next, the rest of the year, some major changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, you know, I don't think any of us knows what. I think a very few people know what, and that's- I would guess about five people in the world. I, yeah. you know, and and I, I have contacts and I've tried, trust me, I've tried to get information and- 
even the top, top people don't know everything because only literally probably about five people actually know. Mm. So, and that's okay. I think I'd rather not know. I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather just work on myself and do my, yeah. and my yoga and, <laughs> and my research. Mm -hmm. You guys ready for the cards? Yeah, let, let's hear it. So I did past, present, and future. I am starting to divinate with runes, having a load of fun with these, okay? If you guys don't know what runes are, this comes from like the deity Odin, Thor, it's Viking. the Viking yeah. stuff, and they look kind of, they got little symbols on them, they're little stones, and I got these little cheap, cheap cards. <laughs> <laughs> that I got at this hippie store down by the shoreline. And then I pulled three different, um, from three different tarot decks, one card for the past and the present and the future. It totally lines up with what we've been talking about. So if we're looking at the past, the first runes I got um, is called, I'm going to probably butcher the pronunciation because I don't speak Viking, but we have Thurisaz. And this is about, Reactive force, directed force of destruction and defense, conflict, instinctual will, vital esotericism, regenerative catalyst, tendency toward change. So this is like that taking down the matrix kind of energy. Wait, this, this is, is the past or present? This is past. Yes. Okay. This is past energy. Okay. Um, so this is this is like breaking free of illusions and breaking free of the matrix type of system. And I'm talking for those who are watching this. Obviously, there's people that have not gotten into this energy just yet. Um, followed by, I'm going to show you guys the tarot cards I got. We got the hanged man. Um, followed by the five of pentacles. Followed by the knight of wands. So it's like that stuck energy, very... It's uncomfortable stuck energy. It's um, an energy where we don't like what's happening because nothing's happening. Nothing's moving. Um, we also might be kind of angry at times with this Knight of Wands, um, impulsive, and um, just it, it's, it's, it's a stuck energy, okay? Then if we're moving into the, the now, we have this, this rune, which is actually my favorite rune. It's about birth, general fertility, both mental, physical, and personal growth, liberation, regenerative power, and light of spring, renewal, promise of new beginnings and growth. So this is about us growing into um, our, our soul growth, in other words, um, rebirthing ourselves, going on a brand new trajectory in our lives, uh, getting acclimated with uh, change because we've been experiencing so, so much of this stuck energy and everything like that. So this is like forward movement. And this was followed by the eight of pentacles, the 10 of cups and the magician card. So what this is saying is it is very vital and important to be working on yourself with the eight of pentacles. Um, it's also vital to really uh, pay attention and be there for your family members that need you. Um, this is, this is about having compassion. Like we were just talking about working on yourself and a lot of changes being made, um, on yourself. So this is kind of like more about personal growth here. And then if we're going into the future, we have Tiwaz, I think is how you pronounce it. This is about justice, leadership and authority, analysis, rationality, um, uh, knowing where your strength is, um, and honor. So it's like, I look at it more like justice system kind of thing. Like um, things are going to start to balance, right? We have that Libra and Mercury and Libra energy, right? Coming forward. And then we have followed by the eight of cups, Bryce's favorite card, ace of cups <laughs> and the six of swords. This is forward mom momentum. This is walking away from the old walking toward the new, new beginnings. Uh, also, this energy looks like um, there could be also some travel involved, so maybe relocations. Um, so this is all the future energy. But it's also forward movement. It's not staying stuck. It's moving forward with the new is kind of what that energy is looking like there. So any questions about any of that? 
Sounds good to me. I like that Ace of Cups. I'll, t- I'll take Ace of Cups any day. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know. If that's you know. the future, it's, it's, cause that, that's the future that I'm, I'm happy about that. He's like, um, let me go to Venus, please. <laughs> no, I, I'm supposed to be <laughs> Venus. I'm supposed to be Venus. Um, I'm going to acknowledge to you guys, I have gotten a bunch of your emails because I asked for emails last time and I've responded to some of you, but next time, um, I know we're probably going to do another part three on this because I've got a lot of questions about some stuff. Um, I've got some questions about diet. We've talked about that before, but we'll get into that in the next Mm -hmm. video and how that energy works and stuff like that. I know Bundas will talk more about that as well. So uh, I know we're over an hour now. So again, if you do have more questions, um, you can email me at esotericatlanta at gmail.com and um, maybe next week, ladies, we can convene again. Three musketeers, musketeer. Absolutely. You know, I think it's important we address questions and comments and stuff like that regarding this, because I think, you know, we can convey the message, but everyone learns differently. I know I always learn a lot differently than other people. So, you know, if we can, you know, go into the information a little bit deeper so that people do truly understand and understand what exactly we're trying to present here so they can, you know, um, better themselves. And, and I don't want to say better themselves because it's like, like Emmy, you said, where you are is where you need to be, but, you know, doing that shadow work and, um, and I'm going on a rant here, so I apologize. <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, I do want to say before we sign off, guys, um, as far as diets, uh, do not um, just wait for our episode before you make a drastic change in your diet. There is not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to diet. So if someone's telling you to be like a fruitarian, that's really dangerous. Um, I am Vata. I could never do that. So um, we'll talk about that in the next episode. So if you do have questions about the doshas and the different dispositions of energy, um, just email me and we'll cover that in the next episode. Uh, but as I always say, just find an Ayurvedic doctor or specialist to help you with that kind of stuff too. But we'll go over the basics of that in the next episode. We'll also talk about the bundas again and some other stuff having to do with the energetic body and what's actually happening because this is something that we've been deprived of in the Western world for many generations. And it's time that we bring it back because this is the original science. So, um, and it'll help you understand yourself better as well. So, um, all right, ladies. We'll talk to y'all. I can't, we're going to have like a four hour episode one day. <laughs> Maybe we could do a live one time and have people come. I on like that. I have to figure out how to simulcast. Maybe I can figure it out. Maybe I, I might have someone that can help me here at the house. Oh, that will work. We could do oh. it on your channel. Yeah. 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 No, my husband knows how to handle this this stuff whatever this is technology <laughs> and everything like that and i know he'll be willing to help out so okay cool yeah if we could do a live then we can do like a q a kind of a thing perfect yeah so i guess if anybody wants us to do a q and a i mean it would you would be the only know. one that could see the questions with your oh, that's that's okay i don't care cool awesome okay. ladies well let us know we'll talk to y'all soon okay bye, bye guys bye.